Welcome to Black Doctors Talk Podcast. I am Dr. Sharon H. Porter, host for this episode and member of the Black Doctoral Network. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Will Brown, Jr., principal owner at Brown Companies and Associates Incorporated. Welcome to Black Doctors Talk Podcast, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. Yes. Thank you. I would love for you to start out by telling our viewers and listeners a little more about your background. Where does it begin for you? Okay. That's an interesting question. I'm not sure how much of this we want to go into, but let me just start with where I was born. I'm a native of Mississippi, born in uh, Mendenhall, Mississippi, as a matter of fact. you know, we've uh, heard the stories and read the stories about Mississippi and the segregation and all of that in Mississippi. I'm a product of that environment, a product of that time. Uh, I grew up uh, on a, uh, a sharecropper farm uh, with my grandmother. Uh, my parents uh, separated early. Uh, my father moved to uh, uh, Chicago. My mom moved to uh, uh, New York. Uh, taking me with her to New York, and uh, neither of my parents were uh, were educated. Uh, you know, in Mississippi during those times, uh, uh, most of the school time, the school years, uh, people had to work the farms. Uh, kids had to work the farms, so they didn't go to school. They could only go to school uh, when the farms have been uh, uh, finished. When the uh, chores of uh, farming had been completed, then they could go to school. And then uh, the school itself was uh, at that time a segregated school. So I did attend a segregated high school, a segregated school system. Uh, I think the school desegregated the year after I graduated, but uh, uh, those were the times in Mississippi where were uh, deprived of uh, education opportunities. Uh, and uh, so we did eventually uh, were able to buy an 80 acre farm through that sharecropping arrangement. Uh, and uh, we worked that farm uh, and uh, we were proud of that, proud of that work. I believe um, I was like the third person in my family's history to even graduate high school. I had a cousin before me that graduated a couple of years before me and a cousin that graduated with me. Uh, but uh, school was not something that we focused on. Education was not the top priority. Uh, I'm the first in my family to earn a, uh, a master's degree uh, and the first and only uh, person of memory of my family to have earned a doctorate. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's basically the, the foundation of me. Uh, I would say that uh, those years in Mississippi, those struggles in Mississippi, uh, strangely enough, uh, were probably responsible for much of my determination to do what I could to succeed, to make a difference. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it worked. Yeah, I, I can definitely see how it could shape what your future would become, definitely. So thank you for sharing that. No problem. Now your work really revolves around leadership. Um, what would you say are your top three attributes or characteristics of an effective leader? That's a good question. Well, uh, based on my experience, uh, and you know, there, there are a number of, uh, I, in fact, there are probably hundreds of different uh, uh, characteristics and uh, uh, descriptions of, uh, of effective leader, effective leadership. I would say, based on my experience, that an effective leader is one who uh, exercises a willingness to hear all ideas, uh, those in favor, those opposed. Uh, uh, a second thing I would say for an effective leader, in my opinion, uh, one who allows followers and shareholders to uh, uh, take part in the process uh, and feel a sense of inclusion. Uh, and the third one, uh, which is probably a, the most critical, I suppose, uh, is uh, someone who applies decisive implementation of necessary decisions after 
uh, after you've clearly reasoned out the uh, an ethical uh, uh, position that you've reached, uh, put it into effect. Uh, I think that's uh, that's what I would classify as the three top characteristics of an effective leader. Thank you. So who has been a tremendous impact on you as a leader? Long story there. Uh, I've long been motivated uh, to sort of understand leaders. Uh, how are these folks made? Uh, who are they? Uh, what are they? Why is he or she a leader? Uh, or how does the society determine who is a leader? And why him or her and not another person whose life and contributions might be just as significant, if not more important? I think my curiosity about leaders and leadership first came to my attention uh, during my grade school years uh, at a time when Medgar Evers was uh, uh, assassinated in Jackson, Mississippi, which is about 50 miles from where I grew up in a place called McGee, Mississippi. I was about 14 years old, I, I recall. And I remember being, uh, I remember being struck by the idea that uh, this man was gunned down for reasons that I, I remember uh, being gunned down because he was a leader a civil rights leader. And I remember thinking and pondering uh, the question of um, what could society be so afraid of? I mean, what's so scary about this individual that someone would, would lie in wait, hide out uh, to bring his life to an end, uh, to, to assassinate uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, leader, if you will. So uh, I remember thinking that they must really be afraid of this idea of a leader. I then start to think about, well, maybe it's the power that these individuals have. Maybe that's what it is. These individuals are powerful. Because I, I, re I recall during that time I was still in school, there were other other uh, people or leaders being assassinated, uh, John Kennedy around the time, uh, uh, Martin Luther King around the time, uh, uh, Malcolm X around the time, uh, Robert Kennedy around the time. And all of these individuals were, were assassinated while I was still, with exception of Robert Kennedy, I believe, all were assassinated during the time when I was still in high school. So I'm thinking that yeah, this, this idea of leadership is, is so intimidating that people want to kill people because of their status as a leader. Uh, and so I'm curious to, to know more about it, find out more about it. And so I start paying attention to um, people who were out there talking and uh, seemingly, you know, uh, taking on this role of leadership. People like uh, uh, Angela Davis uh, and Stokely Carmichael and H. Rep. Brown, Ervis Cleaver. I started looking at all of these individuals with, with a sense of uh, a, a amazement, a sense of interest. And I wanted to know more about them. I wanted to know more about uh, this, this, this idea of leaders and what these individuals represented. So I, I started to pay more attention, observing, asking questions, uh, uh, you know, uh, surrounding this mystique about uh, these leaders. And then I came to a critical question, I believe. I asked myself, hmm, can anybody get it? Can, can I get it? Or must you be born with this special gift to be a leader? Uh, and I wanted to explore that. I wanted to see what, what makes them tick, what, what produces them, what causes individuals to be leaders, if you will. Now, as far as an impact, to be more direct uh, response to the question, uh, there are those who have the obvious uh, impact, some of the people like we just mentioned. But then there are some individuals who, from different sectors of our society and different directions, 
uh, that, as far as I'm concerned, are leaders as well, but they tend not to be labeled that way. I think of, of these individuals as uh, those who have a huge impact on society, whether it be, uh, you know, social issues or economic issues. And, and people like uh, uh, Ken Chanel comes to mind as far as a influential leader, as someone that uh, I would uh, look to as a, a role model, as a leader. And there's a, uh, an individual, a black man, uh, Wally uh, Amos, I think his name was Wallace Amos. Uh, if you remember, uh, uh, the Amos, uh, famous Amos cookies. And I remember uh, being impressed with uh, Wallace Amos because he not only became successful at uh, in the cookie business, the literacy reading program to try to help adults uh, who had not learned to read and write. And of course that touched me because uh, it uh, came home to me because uh, my parents were not able to read and write. And then, you know, there were people like uh, uh, in the private sector, because I was interested and fascinated with leadership in the private sector as well. And I remember uh, uh, being uh, uh, influenced by uh, Lee Iacocca, uh, a, uh, the, the individual who was responsible for uh, getting the government to bail out a, a, a Chrysler uh, motor company, you know, and getting the government to bail out a private sector entity, that was impressive to me. So I was also moved by him. And then on the social side, I had an opportunity to uh, meet a gentleman many, many years ago, uh, Dr. Benny Prim. And Dr. Prim was uh, responsible for starting uh, starting up the first uh, addiction uh, treatment center in New York City. And he went on to do some, some worldwide work in the areas of AIDS and AIDS uh, uh, prevention and, and things of that nature as well. And uh, again, uh, Dr. Benny Prem was also someone who uh, had a, a, a tremendous uh, impact, a tremendous influence on me. So these are individuals from different sectors uh, of our society, but you won't find people like uh, Ken Chanel and uh, uh, Wallace uh, Amos uh, or uh, Lee I. Coker or, or Dr. Prem. You won't find any of these people typically being referred to in our society and particularly in the black community as well, being referred to as leaders. Uh, not sure why that is the case and, you know, but it is what it is. Uh, they're not ignored uh, per se, they're just, they're just not uh, uh, put out there as someone that we advocate as examples of what leaders are all about. Wow, thank you. A, a very nice, uh, varied list of leaders. So thank you for that. Thank you. So how do you encourage creative thinking within a group or even within your company? Another great question, interesting as well. Uh, my experience, in my experience, the best thing a leader can do is encourage creative thinking. And the way you do that is you state the case, you issue the charge, you define and assign the task, and then you get out of the way. You get out of the way of the group, you get out of the way of the organization, you get out of the way of the individual, you let the imaginations and ideas take place. You allow the uh, personal uh, and organizational growth and development to manifest. Uh, without, uh, without allowing it to uh, necessarily shift the organization's mission and purpose, but at the same time, if you stated the case properly and you issued the charge properly and you assign the task properly, then you shouldn't have a problem with the ideas going off the message into different directions. So that would, that's, that would be my, uh, uh, my take on how you encourage the creative thinking within a group or an organization. 
Thank you. So what would you say are the biggest challenges um, facing leaders today as it relates particularly to organizational change? Okay, another great question. Um, organizations tend to resist change for many reasons. Some of those being uh, for self-preservation, uh, when it comes to their positions, when it comes to titles, uh, then there's the idea that uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, lacking a sense of urgency, it can wait. Uh, doubt that uh, change will make things in it better. And uh, whose idea is it anyway? That that comes up as well. You know, depending on whose idea it is. It will be perceived uh, uh, either as uh, an effective organizational idea for change or or face resistance. The greatest challenge facing le leaders today, uh, I would say, concerning organizational change is uh, I, I would put it in three categories, three 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 areas. One, trying to figure out the correct strategies that will effectuate a proper response to objections. Uh, when, when leaders and organizations receive objections, uh, there's a tendency to either run over those objections or dismiss those objections. But there should be a, a strategy in place to uh, uh, engage a proper response to those objections. Make, make them positive if you can, make them useful if you can. The second thing I would say is uh, producing strategies that effectively deal with today's pressing social uh, and uh, social issues and uh, the major paradigm shifts in such areas as uh, uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, uh, technology placement, uh, social media, uh, the internet, uh, and uh, other system change processes needed to successfully respond to uh, contemporary social justice issues. Uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, the political uncertainties, uh, you know, these are, these are some of the, I think, greatest challenges that are facing uh, today's uh, leaders as far as uh, organization or change function are concerned. Thank you for that. Now, your dissertation research, um, it focused on leadership and management disciplines. Can you please share some of the major findings from that research? Ah, thank you. Appreciate that. And you know, I love all, I always love talking about my research, about my work. I used a qualitative study, a blended study, as a matter of fact, as we refer to it. Uh, a qualitative blended study to explore uh, the effect of leadership styles and shared leadership situations and the impact of matched and unmatched leader styles on nonprofit organization funding performance. Now, some of the uh, major findings uh, reveal that nonprofit organization shared leadership situations consisting of matching leadership styles uh, will offer a more effective organizational performance. I also ex uh, expose from the findings that matching leadership styles uh, or does not mean necessarily matching two of the same leadership styles. For example, matching transformational and transformational or matching uh, leader member uh, 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 exchange or leader uh, member exchange or but rather matching leadership styles could be any combination of complementary leadership styles. However, the study, uh, I did not use the study to explore the, the combination of what combination of leadership styles are complementary styles. This was one of those uh, exposed findings that revealed itself from, uh, from the research, from the study, is that uh, uh, complementary styles play a, 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 a tremendous role in this question of uh, organizational performance. So this is an area where, uh, where a gap uh, exists for, for further study 
and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, perhaps in the future collaborating on, on additional research in that area. Furthermore, the findings suggested that effective nonprofit leaders possess the ability to shift in and out of styles to accommodate leadership needs uh, that may arise at the time, uh, which I found to be an interesting, uh, uh, interesting, uh, you know, revelation from the study. And finally, uh, the study showed that nonprofit executive leaders, uh, they hold the notion that effective organizational performance of nonprofit is different than effective performers in the private sector or for private sector organization. I found that to be particularly interesting because I've, I've done as much work in the private sector as I've done in the nonprofit sector, although uh, my nonprofit work has been completely volunteer work uh, over, over the years. But I thought it was interesting that uh, there is the notion that if you are a non nonprofit leader, uh, that your performance expectation or your description as a leader is different than it would be if you were the private in the private sector, uh, which which brings up an interesting point. I mean, it, uh, are leaders uh, 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 possessing different skills in the nonprofit than they possess in the private sector? I left that question out there. Um, definitely. Um great information for future research <laughs> without yes. a doubt because yes. that you know that yes. is something to think about <laughs> yeah, I think so. yes yes yeah i would definitely love to to see that future research <laughs> yeah yeah I, i'm i'm looking forward to it i'm looking forward i mean i'd love to collaborate with someone on that it's um you know i i i, I mean there's, there's much more that revealed itself uh, uh from the research but uh, given the limited time that we have for for our podcast, I, I, I thought that those particular uh, noteworthy findings uh, would be of interest to uh, the listeners of this podcast. Wow, I love that. So with all of this that's going on, how do you stay abreast of current trends in your field and in, in leadership in general? It's not easy. It's not easy. I'm always in search of uh, methods uh, and means to stay abreast of trends in management and leadership. Uh, but I do have some things that I do. Uh, I, I engage uh, uh, some management and uh, leadership associations. I stay involved with them. I become members of uh, professional management and leadership associations, uh, entities like the National Society of Leadership, uh, the American Management Association, uh, the Association of Business Communications. Those are just a few. I also uh, write and have written uh, unpublished uh, materials involving leadership and management issues. I do a lot of that to uh, make sure that I uh, stay abreast of, 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 the, of the, the research that's coming out, even if I'm not necessarily planning to uh, seek publication of a particular piece, I will engage some research some study of it. Uh, to acquaint myself with it, uh, to acquaint myself with the findings, to keep myself abreast of, uh, of uh, what those trends are. Uh, and then I, uh, I, I put them away um, in a file that I maintain. And from time to time, uh, depending on an issue that may come to my attention where I have an opportunity to uh, reach into those files and pull something out, I, I update it. I do current research on it, uh, bringing, up, bringing, it, bringing it up to... Uh, 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 to to where things are uh, uh, for today, uh, relating to that particular subject, and uh, and, and I'm able to uh, uh, to use it. So I found that particular method uh, very very useful to me because I'm constantly going in and out of that file, uh, putting information in that file, uh, updating that file with with, with current trends and whatnot, and uh, from time to time going in extracting something putting it together, uh, presenting a piece or presenting a material, presenting a podcast or, 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 or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I really think um, in, in, as a leader, first of all, and especially um, as you are uh, the owner of your own company, I think it's extremely important um, that, you know, we present ourselves as lifelong learners. Um, 
because so much does change um and and you do yeah. want to keep up with right. <laughs> with everything you know in your industry and right. so i can definitely appreciate um the efforts that you've put in to make sure that you're staying on top of your game <laughs> And let me just let me just say also uh, uh, the, the volunteer work that I do with nonprofit organizations uh, where I take on these uh, uh, board assignments. Uh, I take on these board assignments and nonprofits that involve what is, what is a uh, what is a need for interpretation uh, or the advancement of uh, management or a leadership practice or theory. So I'll, I'll volunteer in that uh, uh, for that for that purpose with the nonprofit. That gives me an opportunity to not only help facilitate what the nonprofit's uh, uh, needs are, uh, but it also gives me an opportunity to uh, explore uh, further uh, issues or, or, or matters that might be germane to not only that particular nonprofit organization and, uh, and, and, and how this question of leadership and management may impact that organization, but I also use it as an opportunity to uh, uh, explore on a larger basis to see how the issue that impact a nonprofit organization one may have the same uh, or some similar type of uh, impact or interest for the nonprofit sector as a whole. So I, I welcome those opportunities when they present themselves uh, as part of my uh, volunteer nonprofit work with nonprofit. I also stay involved with organizations such as the uh, Black Doctoral Network uh, and other uh, 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 entity that offer these sort of opportunities uh, to engage management and leadership findings through workshop presentations, through panel discussions, through poster presentation, webinars, and so forth. Two valid points, volunteering and presenting, because um, both of those give you great experience um, yes. and teaching and, you know, with the learning. Thank you for that. So, Dr. Brown, you've had a robust career, um, you know, a stretch in over many years. Thinking back to the beginning, what's one thing that you wish you had known when you first began your career? Wow, this is, you know, this is a question that I've, uh, from time to time over the years, I've given thought to. Uh, and I, I, I found it to be, uh, uh, from at times, a, a difficult question uh, to answer because I, I recognize that I'm working from hindsight. But uh, I, I do wish I had known or, or I knew at the time when I was beginning uh, to search for a career and prepare myself, I do wish that I knew about the preparation requirements for advancing through corporate America, because that was my that was my focus initially is to become part of corporate America, to uh, you know work in the Wall Streets and work in the main streets, but be a significant player in corporate America. And boy, did I discover how little I knew about trying to not only get into corporate America but trying to survive in corporate America if you have not been properly prepared to meet those requirements for getting there and then staying there. Uh, and as it relates to the second part of my answer, uh, I wish I had known the preparation requirements to own and run a successful business as a black man, uh, including having known if I wish I had known I have possessed a better understanding concerning the role of leadership uh, without uh, without having the benefits of uh, understanding these the, the impact of these issues as a black business owner, you're going into business with the odds against you anyway, but if you're not prepared in these areas of, of understanding what you have to do and how you must be prepared to exist in corporate America, because keep in mind that even as a black business owner, you are bumping heads and engaging and looking to do business with or somehow engage in a relationship with corporate America. That too requires some understanding of how that should be done and how you can maintain and build uh, a successful business under those sort of uh, uh, requirements and circumstances. 
and understanding the role of leadership and how leadership is viewed by corporate America, especially how leadership is viewed if you're a black person in corporate America versus how they view leadership if you're a white person in corporate America. There is a difference in their viewpoint on that. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. And certainly um, just that bit of information right there can help someone right now. <laughs> yes. uh, <laughs> That hopefully, hopefully it does. Uh, yeah. You know, I, 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 I could have certainly uh, uh, used and benefited from uh, uh, having uh, some of the uh, uh, the advice that I'm able to 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 depart nowadays when I'm speaking with individuals. Uh, if I say to myself, uh, if only. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. I love it. So your professional career includes. The founding of the nonprofit Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Memorial Committee Incorporated. And I know that this had to have been a major accomplishment. Can you please share information about this nonprofit? Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this one because I don't get that opportunity too often to talk about that project. Uh, uh, as you can imagine, I mean, how many, how many conversations, how many uh, circumstances are going to come up where you find yourself discussing a memorial statute, uh, uh, especially a memorial statute of someone who, uh, who is, uh, is, is a black man in America or a black woman in America. Uh, well, I served in a, uh, how it all got started, actually, I served in an appointed position with the governor of the state of New York. Uh, I was uh, involved in uh, community politics and that sort of thing. So I got, I was reached out to and, uh, and, and offered an opportunity to work with the governor uh, in the uh, real estate uh, property division of the state, managing the real estate properties and so forth. So when I came to the job, uh, as I always do when I take on a new assignment, I immediately performed an assessment of the issues. And after doing that, I, I, I brought in community leaders and I asked uh, community leaders about their concerns uh, in the community. Uh, I asked how could I be of service to them uh, and how could I be of service to the community? Uh, I asked for their support. Uh, and I said to them uh, very uh, clearly uh, in a very meaningful way, I said, use me while I'm here. Uh, I said, these are appointed positions. Mine is appointed position. I'm going to do all I can while I can with this position. So use me while you can. Use me while I'm here. So they made me aware of a 30-year-old plan to install a statue of a prominent African-American on the plaza of the state-owned property in Harlem. What they uh, explained to me and described to me how politics and a lack of leadership had gotten in the way of producing a memorial, uh, and so a statue never materialized. So when I became aware of this history, I approached my bosses, uh, which included the governor, and uh, with a guaranteed financial backing from the governor, I was able to bring together and, and bring to the table a skeptical community because they've heard these stories before. They've heard those arguments before over the past 20 or 30 years. Everyone had given them, uh, you know, the same story. You know, we're going to make this happen. We're going to make that happen. So uh they were a bit skeptical of another one uh, uh another individual who works for a politician coming in to tell them what he's going to do uh, so i brought together local politicians nonprofit entities uh state government and uh, we began the process uh, to install and unveil a memorial statue uh of the late uh, reverend dr congressman adam clayton powell jr uh, and I left that decision on what prominent African-American they would love to see or would want to see uh, uh, the statue uh, erected of. And they, you know, they overwhelmingly said um, Adam Clayton Powell. Uh, so I created a nonprofit organization, the Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Memorial Committee, Inc. 
as the vehicle to fund the project. I brought to the board of directors of this nonprofit, community group representatives, other nonprofit representatives, representatives of uh, city government, uh, politicians, representatives of state uh, uh, government politicians, um, congressional office representatives, uh, chamber of commerce representatives, and, and regular citizens and users uh, and, and tenants of uh, the government uh, facilities. And with the governor's support uh, in my back pocket, uh, I began to solicit funding for the project, working on design concept within a few months of my apartment. And after about uh, eight years, uh, we completed the more than $2 million uh, project unveiled the larger than life size memorial statue of the late congressman adam clayton powell jr uh, which now stands on the corner of uh, 125th street and adam clayton powell boulevard in Harlem. just amazing i, I just i love that what an awesome accomplishment yeah. so congratulations for that <laughs> yeah it was uh it was it was not easy to do because as you can imagine uh uh politics was uh involved in it all the way and uh and 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 uh, like, I mean, I don't, I am far from being a politician. I, I you know I'm not one that that Derek refers to himself in that category. <laughs> uh, I I uh, found some difficulties in working with the uh, uh, political uh, uh, parties uh, in making this reality because everyone wanted credit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, one party wanted credit uh, on making it happen. One politician wanted, another politician wanted credit. But I didn't care. I wasn't interested in making the credit, and uh, and I made it clear to all involved that uh, anyone can have whatever credit they want. Uh, my only objective is to make it a reality, make it happen. Um, and, and and to continue with politics, what led you to politics? Because you say you don't consider yourself as a politician, but what led you to the work of politics? Ah, uh, I. I made my first speech about when I was about 12 or 13 years old as a delegate from a from a church uh, from my church. Uh, and I was the delegate representing my church at a revival service in, in, in Mississippi when I was growing up. I be began to find some interesting uh, comparison with uh, politicians. They seem to remind me of preachers. Uh, they relied on talking to people to get things accomplished. So I saw talking to people led me to a career in professional sales. And professional sales led me to involvement with community leaders and community organization, which led me to relationship with community politics, which then led me to the pursuit of public office which led me to running for and being elected as district leader representing Harlem's 70th Assembly District. So that's sort of like how I got uh, on this road on, to politics and got involved in politics. Thank you for that. So what has been your biggest failure and what did you learn from it? <sighs> My biggest failure. You know, I think uh, I think when I think back on it, my biggest failure has been not being able to uh, not being able to capitalize on opportunities when opportunities presented themselves. And I'm not sure if. Uh, If by uh, failure, I mean something came to me and I was given an opportunity to produce and I failed to produce. I don't, uh, I don't see too many of those. Uh, it, it may have happened. Uh, I, I don't necessarily recall. Uh, my so I would say that my biggest failure is it's not going out earlier in my in my life, not going out early in my career. 
and searching for and seeking these opportunities rather than in some cases waiting uh, for them and waiting too long for them to come to me. Uh, I think that's probably my biggest failure if I would, uh, yeah, if, if I were to point out one. I, I think maybe I, I waited too long in some cases to, uh, to take actions to do, to do what needed to be done. And, that, that's another and, golden nugget for some yeah when you, <laughs> yeah when you when you procrastinate that way you know uh you know you lose and, and you don't get that time back uh you know you, you just don't get it back uh how do you how do you prepare for uh for, for, how do you prepare for failure is is uh is what i sometimes since those days ask myself and the only way I see where I can prepare for failure, for failure is to make sure that I'm constantly and constantly and constantly adjusting and adjusting and adjusting. Because a failure is not really a failure unless you fail to capitalize on it in some form or fashion. If you don't use that as an opportunity. You know, we, we hear about this all the time. Yes. You know, you fall, you get back up. Well, you got to do more than just get back up. <laughs> All right. You got to do more than just get back up. When you fall, you get back up. You have to make something happen. Yes. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, and and uh, it doesn't really matter what you make happen, but make something happen. Make something happen. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. So, what are you most proud of in your career? Ah. Uh, I think they're probably. Uh, uh, a few things that I'm most proud of. One is that uh, I was able to get that statute uh, uh, completed that we just spoke about. That uh, that to me is you know one of my proudest moments. Uh, the Adam Clayton Powell Memorial Statute. The other is uh, being able to uh, accomplish and education goals and education objectives and achieving a doctorate. And then watching after I did that, watching several of my family members either reach out or give me a call who had not thought about pursuing education before in their life. And suddenly within, within months, within years, they were pursuing uh, undergraduate degrees, they were pursuing master's degrees, and I've got some now talking about pursuing doctorate degrees, and all tell me that they are inspired by what I did educationally. Uh, and so they now want to do something similar. And I am, I am so proud of that. I am so impressed with that. And uh, I, I, I think that probably is uh, one of my uh, uh, biggest uh, uh, and proudest accomplishment. The other one would be able to not only start a business, given the circumstances of which I had to deal with, but having sustained a business as well. I'm proud of that as well. Uh, that I've been able to uh, stay in business as for many years that I have and keep it going. And I'm proud of that. Awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I really do. And, and so all that you've accomplished, you know, you, you shared so many wonderful things that you've done. Certainly you set goals in order to reach those things. So can you talk a little bit about the steps that you take to reach goals? Hmm. Yeah, that's, um, um, that's interesting. I, I prepare, you know, we, we, we hear a lot of talk about uh, preparations, but uh, it's not something that one should take lightly. You, you know, you, you, you have to prepare. And as part of my preparation process, I engage as many uh, other professional and, uh, uh, and and experienced individuals as I possibly can. Uh, I don't uh, I don't think I would uh, say that uh, 
there are any definitive steps that I take, uh, but certainly jump into, uh, certainly understanding what it would require for me to uh, uh, get up if I should fail. Because I think when you when you taking steps to try to succeed, you have to also include uh, consideration for failure and what's what's your plan for failure. Because uh, often when we're talking about uh, succeeding, uh, we're, we're talking about moving forward, uh, which is good, which is what we should do. Uh, we often overlook what happens if you get knocked back. Uh, are you prepared? Uh, for when you get knocked back. And if you do, what are your plans? How do you, how do you plan to adjust for it? How do you plan to deal with uh, uh, the, uh, the failure? So you should have a plan for not only success, but your plan should also include a, a one for failure. And so uh, that's what I do. I, I work on plans to succeed. I also work on plans to fail. And, ho and hopefully I don't ever have to use the one for failure, but <laughs> right. uh, it's, it's, it's part of the preparation, I think, and it would behoove you to do that, in my opinion. So what's next for Dr. Will Brown, Jr.? <sighs> well, I plan to uh, expand uh, my management and leadership consulting work. I plan to do uh, more teaching. Uh, I plan to continue my research involving uh, management and leadership and in areas of complementary leadership styles. I'm particularly interested in identifying what these complementary styles are. Uh, we now know from some studies that uh, certain styles when, when uh, matched uh, produce a more positive outcome than other styles when matched. What we don't know is what styles uh, are best matched to receive, to produce optimum outcome. Well, that's an area in which I would love to research. So how has your affiliation with the Black Doctoral Network enhanced your career? I've been a uh, member of uh, BDN, a Black Doctoral Network, for two years now. Uh, during the first year, I attended my first conference. During that first conference, I met attendees and uh, participants, and we shared information. Some of that information helped me with identifying resources and options uh, for publishing and writing papers and and other career tips, uh, which were very helpful. Uh, during, that, during that first uh, conference, I, I also received potentially consideration of a uh, uh, job opportunity at, at uh, one of the universities, but I decided not to pursue it because I was not ready to step away from my business activities. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, it was um, it was impressive to me that uh, during that first conference that, that that opportunity presented itself. In this uh, second year, which I'm now with uh, a BDN, uh, it has been a very uh, uh, useful uh, organization in allowing me to uh, present myself, present my work, present uh, what I do, uh, present my research, and so forth. Uh, I'm presenting a workshop on the inherent leadership gap in career choices among African-American students. I'll be presenting that uh, uh, in, the, uh, in a few days. Uh, and also, uh, clearly, as we talk here, it has allowed me this opportunity to participate in this uh, podcast, this uh, Black Doctors Talk podcast. Awesome. Thank you. Well, Dr. Brown, it has been a complete pleasure. We thank you for joining us today. Please tell our viewers and listeners where they can go to learn more about you and the work that you continue to do. Certainly. 
uh, you can I can be email at uh, Will uh, well actually Will Brown without the vowel. It's actually W L L B R W N J R B W at ll.com. That's W L L B R W N J R B W at ll.com. Or I can be phoned a text at 917-670-2709. You can also find me on Twitter and you can find me through ResearchGate where I'm constantly uh, you know, in and out of uh, uh, that source, uh, looking at various research and reading various uh, new uh, uh, development uh, papers and so forth. So I can be contacted through ResearchGate as well. Thank you. Please be sure to stay connected to the Black Doctoral Network and connect with us on all of our social media channels. Thank you for joining us today for the Black Doctors Talk podcast. I am Dr. Sharon H. Porter, and we hope you will join us again next time. But for now, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and tell a friend.